Okay, good morning. We're continuing our uh, study in the rule of the, uh, excuse me, the soil of Christianity <coughs> is Judaism from uh, this book, As It Is in Heaven. Today we're going to be discussing the rule of God and how that is taught to us and what that implies for us. Now, if you'll recall the very first lecture, uh, I asked you to keep in mind that when we come to Scripture, we are, we are coming to uh, a revelation that is not American. <laughs> it, is, it is set in the ancient Near East, and it is a Jewish text. And what that means is that when we look at what it is teaching, the first thing that we need to do is eliminate all of our American concepts from our minds because they are not what Scripture is teaching in the context of an ancient Near Eastern Jewish book, especially one that is divinely revealed. So when we talk about concepts such as justice or equality or fairness, those have American concepts behind them that are not necessarily biblical. And you have to be prepared to set your American feelings aside and allow God to be God. Otherwise, you have some serious problems. So. Keep that in mind as we move forward, especially, especially in this, because this outline that I put here is going to become very prominent in chapter two, when we get to chapter two, if we ever get to chapter two, okay? So copy this down, have this at the ready. Uh, we'll allude to it today, not heavily, but when we get to chapter two, it's going to be uh, very prominent, and it's going to relate directly to how we understand uh, worship. Uh, in reference to what we're talking about, I don't know if you've seen this book written by J.I. Blake, J.I. Packer. It's called Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. It's a very short book. It's only 120 pages. It will orient your thinking for the rest of your life. It is one of the, and I don't know if you know Packer. Packer was an Anglican scholar. He, this, is a, this is a brilliant little book. I'll leave it over here so that uh, if you want to look at it. But I would certainly recommend that. One more housekeeping I have. Has anybody seen this book, The Holiness of God by R.C. Sproul? Yeah. <laughs> So there's always there's always one. Uh, okay, if you have not seen this, and you've actually read it, and if you have and <laughs> have not read this, uh, I would I would recommend that you also take a look at this. This is a phenomenal, phenomenal book, talking about who God is in His holiness, and we're going to be talking about that hopefully next week. We may not get to it next week, but hopefully next week. Now I ask that for this reason. How many here will promise me that if they had this book, they would read it? One, two, three, four, five. Well, you had it in the home. Five. I'm serious. If how many will read it if if you have it? Okay. I know the I know the staff at Ligonier. I can get copies of this for everybody. So I will get this for you. If you will read it, and you don't have to pay me for it, I'll, I'll give it to you as a gift. Okay? So one more time, show of hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So seven copies. All right. So that takes care of housekeeping. Now let's get into this. Said author R.C. tells a story. <clears throat> that a friend of his, an Anglican minister, came to the United States. His name was John Guest. He was an evangelist, and he, he derived from Liverpool. He decided to take up residence here 
and he, the first place he lived was Philadelphia. And he wanted to expose himself to the culture of the United States. He wanted to get everything that he could uh, about be, uh, understood about being living, living in this country. So he visited Independence Hall, he visited the Liberty Bell, he visited all the sites uh, that Philadelphia had. And one of the things that he decided that he was going to do was he was going to visit all of the antique shops in Philadelphia. So he walks in, now you gotta realize this is a Brit coming from England, and he walks into these antique shops, and he sees, don't tread on me. Taxation without representation is tyranny. And he specifically focuses on this one little placard. And on this placard, it says, we serve no sovereign here. And when John was talking to R.C., he said, and I'm going to quote him, John Guest said, how can I be a minister of the gospel, a preacher, to a culture that has built into their bloodstream and into their history an allergy and antipathy to all things sovereign. How can you preach the kingdom of God to a people who despise kings? And he went on to say that he found it difficult to communicate the whole concept of the lordship of Christ, of the sovereignty of God, to a nation of people who from the time they are children are educated to despise sovereignty. Now when you think about that, you hear that and you say, well that's really extreme. But if you pause for half a second, You'll sit there and nod and go, yeah, well, that's pretty much who we are. You know, we got rid of King George, and, you know, ever since then, you know, they, George, they wanted to make George Washington king initially, and he said, no, we fought to break away from that. And here John Guest is as a Brit coming to the United States and experiencing this culture shock. And if you've ever been to Great Britain, it works in the reverse as well. How many people have been to Westminster Abbey? been to Westminster Abbey. Who's one of, who is one of the most infamous people that is buried in Westminster Abbey as a hero? Benedict Arnold. Talk about culture shock. Now, I relate that story to you for this reason. I'm going to ask you two questions. I don't want you to answer. I want you to think about it as we move into our discussion. How would you understand God's rule in the universe? In light of that story, how would you understand God's rule in the universe? And the second question is, what do you think sovereignty means? Think about those two questions, because they're going to bear heavily on not only today, but on our future discussions. Now, we pride ourselves in being independent, in our freedom, in our quote-unquote democratic spirit. We're individuals. The only problem is the kingdom of God's not a democracy. When Yahweh speaks in the Old Testament, he utters his law unilaterally. He does not rule by suggestion, sentimentality. He doesn't rule by general opinion, by consensus, or as R.C. says, by referendum. He doesn't seek the advice or counsel of any of us. The Ten Commandments are just that, commands. And the Ten Commandments are a distillation of the entire Old Testament law. When Yahweh speaks, he simply says, thou shalt or thou shalt not. And he exercises absolute authority over his creation and over his people. This is who God is. God is not a nice guy. 
God's not our buddy. We don't have coffee with God on Sunday. God is God. And yes, he is loving. And yes, he is merciful. And yes, he is just. And he is holy. And he is omnipotent. And he is the divine ruler of the universe. I sent you a whole bunch of references, and I hope you had a chance to at least look at one or two of them. Because it makes it very clear that all of this belongs to him. It is his. He created it, he sustains it, and he rules it. And the sooner we get comfortable with that idea that we're not going to whine, huff and puff, hold our breath, and throw a tantrum to get God to act the way we want him to act, the more effective our Christian life is going to be because we're going to realize all that this God has and does for us. He is not manipulated. He is not coerced. He is not cowed. He acts out of his sovereign will. So when we see this, and we come to Jesus beginning his Galilean ministry, and he announces the appointed time has fully come, and the kingdom of God has drawn near. Repent and believe in the good news in Mark chapter 1. At that particular moment, a loud bell, red flags, all sorts of fireworks should have and immediately would have popped into the minds of those Jews who were aware and conversant with their heritage. And this is another part of how we understand that Judaism presents the soil of Christianity. Notice, I just touched on Judaism and Jesus at the very beginning. There is an interconnection. Yahweh's kingship as the God of Israel provided the overarching background and had been a dominant theme in the national worship of Israel for centuries. From the gar garden onward, Scripture clearly establishes and unambiguously teaches that God is king. Kingdom of heaven. A king with a palace and a temple. And we'll unpack that in future lessons. We see this in so many places besides the garden. We see his rule and his kingship in the very creation that he has authority over. We see it initially in the swirling chaos. He stabilizes it. He dissects it. He separates it. Psalm 2.2 2 says in reference to the kings, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and his anointed, saying, well, let us burst their bonds asunder and cast their cords from us. So from the very beginning, we see rebellion against the king. The Exodus, another example of God's sovereignty, mighty, mightier than the thunder of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea. Yahweh on high is mighty, Psalm 93, 4, and I believe that was one of the references I gave. So we see that even when the nations rage furiously, it doesn't phase his rule at all. Yahweh has set, uh, Yahweh has set the king of Israel, his son, on Zion, his holy hill, and his decree cannot be thwarted. His kingship, Yahweh's kingship is unmistakable. Psalm 99.1 says, The Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. Uh, I'll take a, a brief editorial moment here. We have a tendency to have this really warm and fuzzy concept of God who doesn't do anything that upsets us. Hebrews makes it very clear. The book of Hebrews, the New Testament, it is a fearful thing, a 
fearful thing. Repeating a concept we just read in Psalm 99, let the peoples tremble. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We should be really, really terrified. We used to use the term awful, that God is full of awe, as he should be. But the converse of that is as believers, our relationship with him is through Christ as the Abba Father. So when we fear God, the analogy most apt is the way we, we have a relationship with our earthly fathers. We love our earthly father. We know our earthly father loves us, but hey, you know, sometimes mom says, wait till your father gets home. <laughs> so this is what we have to keep in mind when we, when we understand who God is. As Christians, the joy is that we have Christ and that, okay, if something happens to us, it, maybe it's God just disciplining us. But the rest of the world does not have that security. They don't have that assurance. They don't, they can't rest in the fact that, oh, well, this is just a chastising, loving, this is just God the Father chastising us and loving us and just kind of disciplining us. No, he may be judging you, folks. That still is on the table. That was never, <laughs> that was never advocated. So if we understand who God is, we really should be concerned. That's why when people say, Ah, I don't go to church because church is irrelevant. Then you don't know who God is. And that's our fault as clergy. Because we don't tell you this. And we don't make you sit up and take notice that, yes, this is real. And if you want to be protected from that, then you cling, you hold. You never let go of the cross of Christ, ever, because it is Christ that brings us to the Father in that loving, secure manner. Exodus 15, all of Exodus 15, which is a great passage, states very clearly, Yahweh will reign forever and ever. And this historical con uh, consciousness was regularly and routinely celebrated in the national worship of Israel in the Passover. The significance was such that it became a commemoration of his divine rule, Yahweh's mighty works. And even more pronounced than Passover when it comes to this understanding of his rule was Israel's sacred yearly worship as it identifies Yahweh's kingship with the autumnal harvest home, the feast of the ingathering at the turn of the year, the end of the year, or what we call the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, which is so providentially appropriate because we are in that period right now in Anglicanism. We are in our ember days. The ingathering, where God sends out his harvesters you guys harvesting? You harvesting souls for Christ? There you go. And that's what we do. We have a loving God. We have a loving Savior. But don't abuse that love. So, hey world, let's get to it. Come to his house. In the Feast of Booze of the Tabernacles, the celebration of Yahweh's rule. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. God has blessed us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Now, do you see the juxtaposition? Do you see what I'm talking about? God is doing this wonderful thing. He is feeding. He is caring. He's, he is nurturing. He is nourishing his people. And the last thing out of our mouth is, but fear him. 
because you can take that away. The God of Israel was also the God of all of heaven and all of earth who bestowed all of these blessings of harvest on all nations without discrimination. This is his land. We sing a hymn. What's the hymn that we sing? This is my Father's world. Right? Psalm 67 says, Let the peoples praise thee, O God. Let all the peoples, not only Israel, let all the peoples praise thee. And when Israel was obedient, and they truly praised the fount of every blessing, Yahweh's royal dominion would be acknowledged universally. Psalm 67 again. Let the nations be glad. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For thou dost judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Now, I'm going to take a pause once again. I'm going to want to share something here. Equity. Treating everyone, regardless of who they are, the same, right? We have this concept in this country of something called fairness, right? Now, our understanding of fairness may not coincide with Scripture's concept of what fairness is, because in this concept of fairness, there's the flip side that must be included, and it's called mercy. I'll give you an illustration that uh, R.C. used. And it's actually happened to me, too, when I was teaching. A student comes to R.C. Uh, he's teaching in his class. He says, okay, we have four, pa four, uh, four, pair, four papers. They're going to be due they're gonna be due this month, this month, this month, and this month. Okay? Let's just say, January, February, March, and April. Final is going to be in May. Student comes, 95% of the students, 99% of the students turn their papers in on time. One student says, Dr. Spool, I can't do that, I can't do this. I, mean, I my, you know, my car broke down, I was on the way, the hurricane took my house away. Can you give me a little time? Okay. So RC extends the deadline. Next paper comes around. Um, Dr. Spall, I'm really sorry I got sick and I had to go, and I, and I was in the hot. Can you, okay, extends the deadline. And this goes on, and it goes on until the final paper. Dr. Spall, I didn't do that. I, I, I'm just, uh, I'm late. Can you extend my paper? Anyway, that's why. I, I just, I got busy, I didn't get to it. Okay, F. He failed. And he goes, what, 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 what are you talking about? He goes, I, I gave you, I, you've given me a reason in the, I, you were merciful, I mean, and now you fail me? That's not fair. And he stopped and he looked and he said, you want fairness? Okay, here's fairness. You were late the first time, F. You were late the second time, F. You were late the third time, F. So now you failed the course. You want fairness? Everybody else presented their material on time. Why should I have treated you any different? I gave you mercy, and you took advantage. And that's what we have to remember with God. God's fairness is exacting. Just because he doesn't do something, just because he doesn't punish or cast judgment immediately, simply means he's being merciful. And we should never take that for granted or abuse that. So not only does his equity, his equal treatment, play out on all the nations, it also comes with a warning. Let me read Amos. I want to read a passage from Amos. 
as Amos is involved in this time of the year and he comes before the nation of Israel, he says, Lo, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what is his thought, who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth, Yahweh, the God of hosts, is his name. He who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns deep darkness into the morning and, the, and darkness the day and, and darkens the day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea, pours them out on the surface of the earth. Yahweh is his name. He who touches the earth and it melts and all who dwell in it mourn and all of it rises like the Nile and sinks again like the Nile of Egypt who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and founds his vault upon the earth, Yahweh is his name. What is that reference? In that That's Amos. Uh, Amos uh, it's actually combined from three passages. Amos 4.13, 5.8 and following, and 8.5 and following. And Yahweh's mighty acts in creation and in history alike prefigured and anticipated that coming day when he would be obeyed as king over all the earth. That is inevitable. It is going to happen. And this is not an Old Testament concept exclusively. What does the New Testament tell us? Philippians, Acts, on and on. At the coming of Christ, Every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And this concept is so prevalent. And the, and the Jews celebrated this, and all of his past acts, and his universal sovereignty in words that we actually use today in our own service. I'm going to read them to you. And ironically, not ironically, providentially enough, if you read the Psalms, I, when I read the Psalter, I read the Psalter in two different ways. And one of the ways is if you look at the top of the page, it says day one, day two, day three, day four. Okay. Well, yesterday was day 20. Listen to the evening prayer Listen to the, uh, the, uh, yeah, the evening prayer reading of day 20, Psalm 47. Clap your hands together, all ye peoples, so sing unto God with the voice of melody. For the Lord is high and to be feared. He is the great king upon all the earth. He shall subdue the peoples under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose out an heritage for us, even the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved. God has gone up with a merry noise, and the Lord with the sound of the trump. O oh, sing praises, sing praises unto our God. O oh, sing praises, sing praises unto our King. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. God reigneth over the nations. God sitteth upon his holy seat, throne. The princes of the peoples are joined unto the people of the God of Abraham. For God, which is very high, exalted, doth defend the earth as it were, with a shield. This is straight from the Jewish celebration of God's sovereignty and his care over his, the universe. And we celebrate it in the Psalter. Now, it's important to know that Israel, of course, did their own thing, <laughs> much like we do, so we can't be too hard on them. And they were not happy that God was the invisible God and that they couldn't see him the way that Moses or Adam and Eve or others had an interaction with him. So what did they do? They complained to Samuel in 1 Samuel 8, 4 and following, and they said, we want a king like other nations. The very thing that Yahweh did not want, he wanted them to be different, they wanted to be the same. And Samuel, of course, was upset but even when he, Yahweh allowed the monarchy to be created, which, by the way, was prophesied in Deuteronomy, 
even when he allowed it to be created, and he told Samuel, don't be angry, because they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me, he made sure that the king that was anointed was to be a vice regent. It was going to be his representative. And he was supposed to rule with justice as the king of the universe does. When one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, the sun shining forth upon a cloudless morning like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. A righteous king, a just king, as our heavenly king is a blessing to man. And that's in 2 Samuel 23. Unfortunately, the failure of the monarchy, the Israelite monarchy, was inevitable. But it showed us two things. Number one, that Yahweh should never have been rejected as and replaced with an earthly king. And number two, that God's royal son would be a future hope, anticipated, so they thought, through the Davidic line. So Jesus coming and proclaiming that the kingdom of God has drawn near now is making a slightly different connection. One whose kingship of God is not expressly associated with David's line. It is there, but Jesus makes a different connection. And we've already seen this with Melchizedek and the priesthood. Remember? Melchizedek was a priest of the God Most High, and he predates the Aaronic priesthood, which is what Hebrews does by connecting, which what Hebrews does by connecting Jesus to Melchizedek, because he's from the line of David, not the line of Aaron. So the book of Hebrews makes it very clear, oh, no, 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 you can't say he's not a worthy, a worthy priest because Melchizedek was a worthy priest of the God Most High. And Jesus, in making this connection, uses a title on himself that he uses more than any other title in the New Testament. Now, there, the title Lord is used most in the New Testament. But when Jesus refers to himself, he draws on Daniel 7, 22. And there, in that passage, Daniel is presenting the historic recounting of all of the pagan nations with all of their viciousness and all of their ferocity and all of their subjugation. And he uses, Daniel uses the analogy of wild beasts, which is analogous to Nebuchadnezzar's dream of multiple types of metal, gold, bronze, silver, etc. So you have this parallel set up. But in contrast to the vicious pagan kingdoms, the eternal kingdom is bestowed by God, who in Daniel 7 is referred to as the ancient days, is bestowed by God on one like a son of man who comes to the Ancient of Days on the clouds of heaven to receive it. So Jesus is making the connection that he is the Son of Man. He is the one that ascends to the heavenlies. He is the one that approaches the throne. He is the one who the Ancient of Days, God, gives the eternal kingdom to. And when we look at it in these terms, the Son of Man carries with it a status that is related directly to who he is in his being. He is divine. And it anticipates an incarnational moment. It anticipates the incarnation. And the Son of Man is endowed by his creator with dominion over the earth and all that it contains in the land and in the air, and in the sea. Even the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews 2, 
6 through 8 draws on Psalm 8 to present this motif. So the development of these, comp uh, these uh, companion concepts of the kingdom of God and the Son of Man might have and probably did create some confusion in the Jewish mind. I mean, because they're looking for a purely earthly kingdom. They're looking for David's true son to come swooping in on his white steed. The sad part is some might even, some even took upon themselves to kind of, oh, let's just usher in this earthly kingdom. You know, we don't need to have, uh, you know, to wait for Jesus to do it. We're going to do it. And they were following Psalm 149 where it says, the high praises of God are in their throats and a two-edged sword in their hands who engage in battle against the nation to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. So this would have confused even some. Even during the Christian era, some wound up doing this. So confused were some of these people that something quite different than what they generally expected that even our beloved John the Baptist, hearing the reports of Jesus' ministry, kind of took a half a step back and said, uh, what's going on? Um, are you the one that we're supposed to be waiting for? And Jesus had to allay his fears. Tell John what you see. He had to be reassured that the threshing floor of Israel would be gathered into the wheat and the chaff would be burned. And remember this. As Stephen was being stoned, what were the last things that he said? But he being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and he saw the glory of God and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God and he said, look, I see the heavens open and who? And the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So the connection of the Son of Man with the Kingdom of God indicates one implies the other. And in the teaching of Jesus, however, there were two phases to this, and this also kind of set everybody on a kilter. Because the present phase, his first coming, was marked by rejection, restriction, and humiliation. It wouldn't be until his second that he would come by power and glory. His entire ministry is the proclamation of the kingdom of God. When you look at the Gospels and you look at what Jesus teaches, everything he teaches is in connection to the kingdom of God. Every parable, in some way or another, refers to the kingdom of God. I, I challenge you, look at the teachings of Christ. Just go through it. If you get a red letter edition, it'd be easy. Just go through and look at it. Everything is about the kingdom of God. How much more significant can this concept be than to have the Son of God himself spend his entire ministry talking about everything, including the gospel, in relation to the kingdom of God. Because he was the king. What else is he going to talk about? And he said, the Son of Man will be glorified, but unfortunately, he first must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. In his first manifestation, he comes as the suffering servant undergoing the baptism of death. But that death, that death, unleashes the full power of the kingdom of God and therewith reveals the glory of the Son of Man. Something that no one at that time would have understood. And I dare say most of us truly don't understand the full implications, even today. I mean, we've got an idea of 
we really don't know what it fully means. In his very passion, Jesus fulfills the dual elements of what was written concerning the Son of Man and the Kingdom of God. And it is repeatedly, repeatedly written that the Son of Man must suffer. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, Jesus said at the Last Supper. His arrest in submission to the soldiers with his comment, let the scriptures be fulfilled. And the hallowing of God's name and the doing of his will, the hallowing, keeping God's name holy and doing his will are synonymous with the manifestation of the kingdom of God. And never, never was his name so truly sanctified as in him who accepted the cross with the words, not my will, but thine be done. Origen referred to Jesus as the autobasileia, the one true monarch, the autocrat, the king of the universe. And even the Romans, even the Romans, though it was kind of out of the side of their mouth, recognized Jesus, King of the Jews. And not to state the obvious, but the, determine, but the death of Jesus determines everything that we understand about the New Testament. And that the Old Testament points forward to his death because it is explicitly taught by each and every one of the New Testament writers. It's impossible, however, to ignore that in some sense, his execution as king of the Jews at the hand of Rome can't be glossed over. To the believing Jew when it was announced that the Messiah as foretold by the prophets, had come, suffered, and was crucified, they must have went, what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. My hearing aid was turned off. I didn't catch that. What did you just say? And as the gospel spreads, and it reaches the Gentiles more and more, get moving further and further away from the event, Jesus' divine kingship would have seemed to them to be just a faint echo in its relationship to his bringing salvation. Because after all, how important really, I mean, how important really was a Jewish, was Jesus as being a king, a Jewish king to a bunch of Gentiles? I mean, really? Yet, when we look at the Gospel of John, and we see how John relates this and his meeting with Pilate, his divine kingship suddenly, suddenly becomes the forefront of the entire discussion for both Jews and Gentiles. It has to. Time and distance from Jerusalem would have allowed the connection of the two concepts, his salvation and his divine kingship to be brought back into closer proximity and connection for Gentiles when they would read or reread John's account of the in interaction between Jesus and Pilate. Where is Jesus brought? He's brought into the Praetorium. The representation of Caesar's authority. Where none of his accusers and his prosecutors could go for fear of, fear of defilement. Separation from the, from the class. And then Pilate <clears throat> asks the question to Jesus. Look, are you king of the Jews? And what did Jesus say? Well, that's the word you use. You use king. But that kingship wouldn't have been something that even that the Roman law would have would acknowledge. So when Jesus responds to Pilate, and he goes, well, look, my kingship is not of this world. If my kingship were of this world, my servants would fight. For I was born, and for this I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth 
hears my voice. Now, Pilate's interest may have been minimal at best, but to those who read Jesus' words or read them when they were first published, and I dare say to every one of us since, they spoke and still speak of a king and a kingdom of enduring importance and authority. And the title on the cross, obviously meant to mock Jesus, becomes the central theme of Christianity. Christ the King ruling his kingdom, reigning from the tree. The apostles, as well as the disciples, in proclaiming Jesus as Lord and King, proclaimed among the nations a gospel that was presenting this Lord and this King as the crucified one. This king thus reigns as God at the right hand, and he is the king who is who vindicated his sovereignty by the shame and the agony of the cross. And the Apostle John states it better than any of us could ever have stated it when he says, There will come a day when all heaven and earth proclaim the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And if I had a better voice, I would sing Handel's Messiah right now. And in closing, let me say this. I recently read a quote by Sam Bray and Dean uh, and Dean Keen, the, 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 the editors of the new 1662 International Version, which is getting pretty good, re pretty good reviews. And this is their statement, and I want you to remember this, because we're going to come back to this. Liturgy helps us remember that worship is a serious business. We live in a democratic age, and we find it easy to be casual, but struggle with formality and reverence. Just spend five minutes at your average church before the service begins. What did you do? How was the weekend? Did you watch the game? Did you blah, 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 blah? Where's the focus on being in God's house? Focusing on the sovereign God of the universe who died for you, who is waiting for us to worship him. We've forgotten what it means to be a subject reverently approaching a king. But in worship, we approach the king of the universe, the holy, omnipotent God. Now, I have a whole bunch of scripture references, and I unfortunately am not going to get to them today because I'm going to stop right now and open it up. For, we'll deal with this next week because we're going to talk about how <coughs> scripture speaks specifically about what we've just discussed, okay? And when I say specifically, I'm going to read to you just the titles of the sections so that you'll know what to anticipate next week. You don't have to write it down. You don't have to write it down. Because I'm, we'll, we'll go over it next week. We're gonna be talking about how this manifests itself in God's sovereign control. God's sovereign control over all things, that all things belong to God. His sovereign control of the stability of the physical universe of the mode of our death, of the length of human life, the circumstances of all the nations, the judgment of all the nations, salvation, the good acts of men, and the evil acts of men. Protection of believers, all of the trials of all mankind, his choice his sovereign choice coming from his own will and his decisions which are immutable and unchangeable. So that's what we're going to talk about next week. So I'm going to stop and open it up for questions. <laughs> maybe go, it's a small thing, but could you go back to where you were talking about Jesus was brought in front of Pilate and that the Jewish um, temple I guess the Pharisees were, I don't know, yeah. couldn't okay. come in. There was a rule against them coming. <coughs> yeah. They, um, by, by entering, 
um, the praetorium, they would be defile, ritually defiling themselves by going on to Gentile land. Traditionally in Israel, and this is what we don't understand, if at all possible, if at all possible, when the Jews traveled, they would avoid Gentile land. I mean, they would literally go across the Jordan and go up the east side of the Jordan to avoid running across Gentile land if they had to. And if they, if they were required to actually go through Gentile land, when they got home, they'd burn their clothes. So it's just Israel it's their instruction, or what they thought their instruction was, was to completely stay away from Gentiles, to have no involvement. It's the typical, it, it's the typical interpretation of the Jewish Mishnah, which basically said, okay, Israel is supposed to be separate from the nations. Well, how do we be separate from the nations? And then they, you know, and they keep pushing the boundary and pushing the boundary and pushing the boundary until it's, well, we're not even going to walk in their country, and if we have to, we'll burn up doors. Hopefully they were alone when they did that, but okay. So. Which is another reason why the Gentiles had such a dislike for the Jews because they kept themselves so separate. Mm -hmm. And they had all these rules and regulations that they had to live by. They didn't understand that at all. Yeah. So they just made them the scapegoats for everything bad that happened to them. Oh, to the yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a fair assessment. If you, it's interesting if you see. Um, I'm not sure if you have, but there's a scene in the Chosen where Peter is standing before a, a Roman centurion. And the Roman centurion is so um, filled with joy because of what he has discovered about Christ that he grabs Peter and starts to hug Peter. And you see Peter standing with his arms like this until he finally goes, he puts his arms and he, and he okay, okay. And then after he goes, okay, we're done. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you know it, it's 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 a touching moment and it's a moment of levity, but it depicts the mindset of what a Jew would have thought. It's like you know, get away, don't touch me. Which also gets to the mystery of the Jew and the Gentile being one church. See, Gen the Jews knew the Gentiles were going to be saved. That was predicted back in the days of Abraham. What they didn't know is that salvation meant, oh, wait, hold on. <laughs> we're all going to be one. <laughs> no more separate stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Anything else? Did you read that liturgy quote? Oh, the quote from uh, yeah. Keith? Yeah. The liturgy helps yeah. us remember. Yeah. Uh, do you want it? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll email it to you. You don't have to write it down. Do you, if any, who else wants it? Well, you know what? I'll just send it to the group, and those who want it, I'll send you the quote. That's, it's a great, that's a great quote. And where is that from? <clears throat> it's from the, um, I believe it's from the foreword of the 1662 International Version of the Book of Common Prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to get one of those. Um, everybody keeps, uh, most, of the, most of my friends keep talking about it. It's like, okay, I guess I'm going to do it. Suck it up and buy one. Well, I have a 1662, but I guess the international version updates it. Takes a lot. Takes out a lot of the uh, the elements of, uh, <laughs> ironically enough, elements of uh, worship and praise of the king and the monarchy. So, but we'll see. So that's it. Nope. No questions. Not by any means. Wow. <laughs> I got off easy. No. No, I'm oh. <laughs> She's storing them up. <laughs> well, ne ne next week I guarantee you there will be questions. You go to Genesis and it says, God said, and there was. God said, and there was. Then you go to John, and it was through him, Jesus, all things were made. I need that through explained. What does it mean when it says, 
through Jesus? Well, um, there, there are two aspects of that uh, we can we can discuss. Number one, um, Jesus is the Word of God, right? Yes. Right. I mean, yes. in the beginning was the Word. Yeah. You know, so Jesus is the Word of God. God. Right? Okay. So in that sense, when it says God spoke and it came into existence, what he's saying is the word is involved in creation. Now, when you talk about through, it's like um, I communicate to you when I make uh, let's say I make a movie. Let's say I've made Ben Hur, right? And through the movie Ben Hur, Sir Lou Grade communicated many, many things, right? Mm -hmm. Not the least of which was the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. So in that sense, God worked through Jesus, the Word. Still mulling that over. Yep, yep, yep. I'm still going down a lot of rabbit trails. Okay. All right. Well, you know, just ask. You got any questions? Just ask. More than happy to answer your question. Well, the Trinity is always. Don't even start. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask that question. No. <laughs> Don't go there. No, you're not supposed to. Let me, there are. There are. Let, let me. Uh, since you mentioned it, I'm just going to throw this out for you. There, there are elements of scripture that are simply mysteries, period. And the church gets itself in trouble and has gotten itself in trouble when it moves from one extreme to the other. When it moves on the one hand to the rational extreme and tries to so define and so pin down and so articulate certain doctrines that it simply becomes a proposition and it sucks the, it sucks the mystery out of what we're talking about. And then there's the other extreme which makes it so mysterious mm -hmm. that we have no idea as to what it is. Well, that's not how God communicates. <clears throat> he communicates mystery so that we can understand elements of the mystery while it, re while it retains its mysteriousness and remains a mystery the two natures of Christ how do you understand that not a clue I, I for me I rely on what the early council said Chalcedon not mixed not merged not separated not divided but how they exist as one, I mean, don't ask me. How can we have one God in three persons that isn't three separate gods? I don't know. And the more you try to analyze that and unpack that, the more you're going to get yourself in, in trouble. Now, I'm not saying we need to be mindless and we need to, you know, unscrew our heads, put them under the pew, and not think. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, we here's the principle that Anglicans and most of us in the Orthodox tradition recognize Scripture is the only infallible authority. Note this: the only infallible authority of doctrine and faith and life. But it's not the only authority. Reason is an authority, and tradition is an authority. But one bishop described it this way, and I love the illustration. It, scripture, tradition, and reason are like a big wheel. Remember the big wheels when we were kids? <laughs> Scripture's the big wheel in the front. Tradition and authority are the two small, lesser wheels in the back. So when we get to these doctrines, what we'll do is we go as far as we, come, we go using our reason, and then we look at what did the church say? And what has the church said for 2,000 years? And we rest on that, unless something truly spectacular 
is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit through Scripture, where we can say, oh, we need to tweak this, or we need to modify that. But you do so <laughs> with much trepidation. And you're very careful, because when the church speaks for 2,000 years on a particular subject, and you come up with a understanding or an interpretation of it that nobody has ever come up with ever in the history of the church there's only two options and the first one is wrong <laughs> yeah. well the church was wrong no I don't think so <laughs> no. you need to reevaluate what you've done if you are so far out of line with what the church has said historically now the church is not infallible but it is authoritative and it does speak, and we'll get to that in the book as well later on. I do, I do address that issue. So all of these things you can see I'm kind of just throwing out little breadcrumbs to keep you thinking, oh, he's going to get to that. Oh, he's going to get to that. We're going to get to all of this stuff. It all comes into play as I describe it in the book. Speak now. My director and boss has to leave here, so I'm going to have to cut the camera off as soon as you uh, stop asking questions. Is Daniel the first place where the Son of Man is used as a... No. 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 Son of Man is a... Is a is the, the Son of Man is used in, in different contexts. Ezekiel talks about the Son of Man. Um, Ezekiel is called the Son of Man. Meaning... But in this concept... In this, in this uh, concept as the one to whom the eternal kingdoms are bestowed. Yeah, that's in David. And hush below the ground. Nothing? Okay. Just an observation that what you had us read research put us in our place as temporary tenants of God's creation and you best be reading it as good as you found it if not better. There, there is there is so much <clears throat> that can be and probably at some point should be unpacked when we utter the very simple phrase that Yahweh is king over all. That's a very, very simple statement until you start to think about A, Yahweh, and then you start to think about his kingship, and then you start to think about the kingdoms that he bestowed on Christ and then you start to think about what it means to be involved in a kingdom, like those two authors said. We don't know what it means to be subjects. John guessed. How can I speak to people about the king of the universe, Jesus Christ, the Lord God himself, when an entire country rejects the fact that he is the king of the universe. And it should truly impact every aspect of our lives, especially the one upstairs. That's the one time, the one time of the week Generally speaking, the one time of the week when God's people gather together in God's house, it is God's house. It is God's house. And he brings us here so that we worship him together. And we enter and function as if it only begins at 11 o'clock. Yeah.
you enter someone's house as a guest, when does your behavior as a guest begin? The minute you walk through the door. God invites us every Sunday, commands us every Sunday to worship him. And yet we walk through those doors. It's, it's just another place to socialize. All of that made me think that, okay, this body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So I am the tabernacle mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit. And yet, when I invite him in, I only let him as far as the narcissist. Yeah. If I let him get in any further, he's going to redecorate. That's right. <laughs> That's a great way of putting it. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah. You let him in, what's the first thing he's going to do? I got a clean house, man. This place is a mess. All right. Next week, we'll hit those other topics. And I promise you, we will get, we will get to the first chapter. I promise. Here, here. <laughs> oh, gosh.